Okay, so welcome everyone. Very cool to see so many people people from so many different places. So I'm here with my colleague Tony Rumaner. My name is Alexander Vaz, and today's topic is on deliver practice for motivational interviewing. As our wonderful guest expert for today, we have Robert Schultz. So Tony, you just want to give the quick introduction here? Yeah. So uh, my name is Tony Rumaner, and joined by my colleague Alexander Vaz, we're with the Sentio Counseling Center. We provide low fee online therapy for California residents, starting thirty dollars a session. And we have openings for teens, couples, and adults. So please consider us for your referrals. We also do intensive deliberate practice supervisor training. So if the content of today's webinar interests you and you want to do kind of a higher level, more intensive level of deliberate practice training, please check out our website, which is uh, there on the screen. I'll put it in the chat as well. Thanks, Alex. All right. So like I said, we're very glad to have with us Robert, uh, who uh, will be our guest expert for today and our multi uh, motivational interviewing expert. So I'll just do a very quick presentation here of Robert Schultz. So Robert has served in many clinical and leadership roles over the past 25 years, working in university, community, mental health, forensic, and private practice settings. He has served as an adjunct professor of psychology at Pepperdine's Graduate School of Education and Psychology for over 20 years, teaching courses on substance abuse treatment and forensic psychology. Importantly, Robert is a member of the Motivational Interviewing Network of Trainers, known as MINT, and regularly provides motivational interviewing training and consultation for a variety of criminal, criminal, criminal justice, education, mental health, and addiction treatment groups. So thank you for being with us today, Robert. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here and honor. I look forward to our conversation today. Cool. So let me just uh, take a moment to as quickly as possible describe why we're here. And we tend to encapsulate the gist of our work in making this distinction between conceptual learning and procedural learning. So as most of you know, a lot of the resources, the teaching or learning resources in the field of mental health tend to be what might be, might be called conceptual learning, meaning you learning about the theory of therapy or theory of psychotherapy, diagnosis, treatment through reading books, through attending lectures, through watching videos. And those are all great. We don't want to take away from those. We want to keep those and have more of those as well. But what we've often found in the reviews of the literature and just our experience training around the world is that often training programs do not balance conceptual learning with procedural learning. Procedural learning being the kind of teaching that you do by doing or learning by doing. So for example, you see the image here of uh, the playing the piano. It's a difference between learning how to play a scale, actually playing it and getting feedback on how you're doing versus trying to learn the piano by just reading books on the history of the piano, which might be very interesting, but it won't get you to Carnegie Hall, I think. <laughs> <laughs> so our whole thing, and this is based on decades of um, expertise research, is that for you to become an expert in psychotherapy or in any particular therapy model, the best way to do so is to integrate conceptual learning with procedural learning. Now, because there are many conceptual learning resources out there, there are many books, many videos, many lectures on the theories of psychotherapy and specifically on the theory of motivational interviewing, what we've been doing over the past few years is to also create resources for procedural learning so that clinicians and mental health practitioners might also practice skills uh, in a role play fashion so that they can get better and better at important skills. So this journey has started actually before this book series, but it has culminated into this book series that Tony and I have been editing for the American Psychological Association for the past few years. And on the screen here, you see just an, some of the books that we've been doing for this APA book series. And we're doing a bunch more as we're talking right now. And each book focuses on skill building exercises for each of these therapy models. 
So the authors of these books have to create skill building exercises to enhance the procedural learning of these models. So we've put out a book on the, the American Psychological Association series for the lower practice in motivational interviewing. So this book basically, and here you see the 12 exercises that encapsulate this book. These are the 12 skill building exercises that are present in the Deleuze practice in motivational interviewing series. And we'll go back to this list in a moment. Uh, before we jump into the specifics of this particular list of exercises, I want to start off by, by throwing a question to Robert, which is kind of a, a broad question. You know, in your experience as a, a mint trainer, a motivational interviewing trainer, what challenges have you noticed in MI training and for MI trainees that the Lord practice may, may help with? Yeah, it's a great question. And I, I think I even, I'll, I'll start off just by even just talking about my own development first as, um, you know, I, I had been trained in motivational interviewing, you know, going back really to the beginning of my career. And, it, and and really thought I'd been practicing it for quite some time. And it was only when I I, I hired a coach and I wanted to go through the mint process and was really sort of forced into doing more deliberate practice that I that I realized what I didn't know and and how the things I, I was really missing in my practice. And so, I think for me, the, the sort of the lived experience of going through that as a, you know, having been licensed for many years, practicing, and in fact, even teaching motivational interviewing was sort of one of the greatest teachers for me. And I, and I think, you know, I think when we, when I think about the challenges too, you know, when, when we go through our graduate training, that often is the time in our careers where our work is under scrutiny, and we're receiving a lot of supervision, and um, and yet even then, um, there there often isn't the time to really go through in really great detail, case by case, really talk about specifically what we're going to do in a particular session, <clears throat> and and I think that's been sort of something lost along the way in terms of clinical training that I, I think deliberate practice brings us back to, you know, much like, you know, I think when, you know, if you're studying to be a doctor or an auto mechanic and, you know, that training is so hands-on, you know, no one's going to, no one's going to let a surgeon and training, you know, into the surgery room without, you know, several other folks that have a lot more training and really watching them, go through that process. But I think in our clinical training, um, while I, I'm not saying it doesn't happen at some places, I think in a lot of our training sites, that just doesn't exist. Right. So I think it's one of the challenges um, that we faced as a, as a field. Yeah. One thing, I think this, this is a challenge for most therapy models, but it might be particularly interesting challenge in learning motivational interviewing is that when you read the text of motivational interviewing and the skills, for example, mm -hmm. thinking about simple reflections, complex reflections, we find that a lot of people intuitively, quote unquote, yeah. get it. They think this is easy. <laughs> I already do this. And in our minds, we're always so much more eloquent than when we actually do it. Uh -huh. Speak a bit to this uh, difference, this gap between yeah. you know, understanding something cognitively versus actually doing it correctly. Yeah, I think, it, you know, it's that whole thing that it, am I sort of feels like common sense. And, and yet we know the, the common sense isn't common practice. And I think we know that when we, when we really kind of look at people's work, you know, again, I'll kind of use my own experience, you know, thinking I was sort of like, I knew what I was doing. And then my coach kind of having me do some assessments and and then starting to record sessions and coding my sessions and realizing, whoa, I really, I really, I, I know some things, but I have some really big growth areas and other areas. So I, I think it is, it's it's sort of that we, we sort of think we're better at, at what we do than, than we are. 
And I think we we know that from the, the psychotherapy process literature that people sort of overestimate how successful they are, how helpful they are. Yeah. And until we really get that that real feedback, both from you know listening to ourselves or you know listening to our clients about how things are going, we don't really know. Yeah. Um, and, and we and it's sort of humbly acknowledging and being open to this idea that um, there are things that we don't know and there's things we're going to miss unless we have mechanisms in place to sort of catch it and be open to continuing to learn. Yeah. So we had mentioned before this list of uh, 12 skills. Of course, every therapy approach, including motivational interviewing, has a lot more than 12 skills. But these are 12 skills in this uh, APA motivational interviewing book that um, were focused on in the book for skill building. And we can see it kind of goes all the way from so simple reflections, complex reflections, going into the deeper topics of eliciting change talk, double-sided reflections, all the way down to autonomy support, agenda mapping, elicit, provide, elicit. What was your experience in in through learning these skills and, and particularly in training trainees and supervising trainees? Again, the difference between teaching mm -hmm. these skills cognitively, but the gap between understanding these skills cognitively, but then the need to role play and actually try mm -hmm. to get it in your bones. That gap between the cognitive versus procedural element. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think I think the you know most graduate students, you know, you know, in their intro, their first counseling theory classes or their counseling skills classes, you know, they learn about simple reflections or they learn about you know maybe even they don't necessarily call it complex reflections, um, but I I also think it's the um, it, it's the like you know we talk a lot about the sort of the ratio of how you know reflections to questions when we when we do mi work and and why we pay attention to that and you know one of the things i think when i'm when i'm training people i think there's sort of a tendency to fall back on let's just ask keep asking questions to people and and yet oftentimes you know we we call it the question and answer trap and in my in my world <clears throat> how that sort of interrupts flow or it you know, really changes kind of the hierarchy of the conversation from being one of collaboration and mutuality <clears throat> to being one where, you know, as the practitioner, we're driving the conversation, which is not, you know, congruent with what we're trying to do from in my perspective. So I think really honing in and helping clinicians early in their training to really begin to develop the ability to form those complex reflections, really teaching them how to, even though in your head, you may wanna ask a question, how to flip that question into a reflection. Mm -hmm. I think that's the art mm -hmm. of work. Mm -hmm. And and it really takes practice. I, I find myself constantly, you know, wanting to ask a question and having to pause and learning how to, um, you know, restate it into a reflection. Right. So I think it's the, those those earlier ones in your list there that I think we you know most people think, oh, I know how to do that. That <laughs> you know, really wanting to spend time helping people get that foundation, um, and then you know, as you're kind of moving into things like trying to elicit change talk, you know, just you know, helping people you know, even just understand what is change talk and, you know, what is it we're going for there? Um, and, and then I think it really starts to get fun when you're, when you're really able to start to play with the different types of reflections, like double-sided reflections are really, if I had to pick a favorite, like that's, like, I love double-sided reflections because it really, you know, since most of our, a lot of clients come in and they're really ambivalent about change, really could to really be able to um <clears throat> you know to reflect into that experience of ambivalence in a way that maybe they've never experienced before yeah. because they've either had clinicians who are trying to force them to change right. or you know just really reflect them in their stuckness um 
that double-sided really allows for both to occur. Yeah. So to give people a taste of doing a little practice exercise, uh, we talked a little bit beforehand to choose one of these skills and give people a chance to actually practice this a little bit. Now, we won't be doing a, a live role play with just one person doing it. We'll actually invite everyone in through the chat in order to be able to do this and get everyone involved. So we focused, uh, Robert, for today, we're going to be focusing on complex <laughs> reflections, mm -hmm. guesses on what the client means. And the way a little practice exercise works is that for each of the skills, we want to create what's called skill criteria, which are these numbered statements here. And the skill criteria are really the therapist's observable behaviors, verbal or nonverbal behaviors, that are distinctive for that particular skill, right? So these three things here are the three things that are observable, behavioral, that the therapist should be doing in order to do a complex reflection. And I'll just read them out loud here. So the, the skill criteria for this exercise is for the therapist to guess at the deeper meaning in the client's words, that reflections are offered as statements, not a question, and that the therapist's reflection does not include their own opinion, advice, or information. And we have an example here. So these are all pre-scripted client statements. So let's imagine the client says, I drink about a six pack of beer a day. Therapists could respond with a complex reflection saying, beer is a big part of your life, which would go beyond a simple reflection, right? but it's going a bit beyond what the client just says in trying to guess at the deeper meaning of the client's words. And notice that the therapist is not asking a question. It's a statement, right? And I imagine just before we jump into the, to the practice, Robert, I imagine there's often the, the difficult balance here of how, how is it different to guess at the deeper meaning versus including too much of your own opinion? How do you actually make that distinction? <laughs> Mm. You want to say something before, about that before we jump in? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it's it's really just trying to, you know, like <clears throat> it's being aware of our own internal reactions to client statements. You know, we might call it counter-transference and another and another sort of theoretical model, but it's really trying to keep focused on you know the client's experience. You know, what is it? What is it they? What else that's maybe being said that's not being said you know i like to think of the the iceberg <clears throat> you know there's sort of the statement on the surface but like what else what else might be possibly um happening or what else might they be thinking about as they're making statements and just keeping that focus there so what we are going to suggest for everyone who would like to participate is we're going to keep showing these free skill criteria. This is what the therapist is trying to meet. And we're going to be providing several other client statements. And for those of you who want to participate, we'd invite you to write uh, a client, uh, sorry, a therapist response on the chat that would meet these skill criteria. So for example, here's a new client statement. Client says, my kids really want me to quit smoking. Now, for all those who might want to give it a try, and Robert will then provide feedback, try improvising a response for a complex reflection meeting this. And I'll read them from the chat, all right? <clears throat> um, so here, Robert, some of the first uh, therapist responses are already coming in for your feedback. Mm -hmm. uh, one is, uh, they're really, or they're concerned about you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> How was that one? Yeah. Oh, okay. You want me to jump in? Yes, on please. <clears throat> sure. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's trying to, right, kind of get below, like, maybe why why the why the client is telling you this. And I, and I think in parentheses that you have there, the sadness that might be coming out in the statement, mm. which sort of may, you want to kind of picking up on that in your reflection. I also, I also just pay, pay attention to as we're kind of, when I think about reflections, you know, one of the, one of the things that was my coach just really talked with me about, and we know from the literature is like, keep it succinct, mm. 
like some you know less is more mm. oftentimes in these reflections and so that first one really hit the mark there great here's another one your kids are really concerned about your health yeah, kind of really tapping into, you know, the, you know, the, the, the kids feelings about things, um, you know, just, you know, kind of going a little bit beyond a simple reflection and, you know, sort of taking a guess at, you know, it's like, what's, what's the hunch there? I always kind of right. ask that question. What's your hunch? Right. Okay. Kids are, kids are concerned about health. Right. Here, here's another one slightly different. Your children's opinion is important to you. Hmm. Yeah. So kind of really <clears throat> getting at that they are they are thoughtful and they really do care what their kids have to say. Hmm. And so kind of tapping in, you know, to like an empathic side of them, hmm. that they're in they're aware and they're in touch with their their kids' feelings and thoughts. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Here's a, even a different one. Uh, your health is important to your kids. Hmm. <clears throat> your health is important to your kids. Yeah, kind of tapping into, you know, I, I think as a parent <laughs> myself, like, you know, like our like kind of an acknowledgement that our that you know our children are aware or they're aware of you know this person's health and what that might mean for them as well. Be interesting to kind of see what the client would say back to that yeah likewise uh your kids are affected by your habit of smoking mm. <clears throat> yeah so definitely kind of going a little deeper mm. and which may elicit specifically some of the things the kids are seeing mm. or the kids are experiencing so it's a it's a way to sort of elicit more information about the reasons right. why the children are concerned about <clears throat> their right. their parents drinking or smoking. Yeah. So so all of these responses are viable, mm -hmm. potentially good responses. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Great. I I just want to highlight something, which is. Uh, you know, one of the concern, one of the most common concerns we hear about deliver practices, people are like, oh, it's going to turn me into a therapy robot or just I'm going to be memorizing lines or whatever. And what we're seeing is the exact opposite. What we're seeing is deliver practices giving everyone the opportunity to kind of explore their own personal style of therapy. Mm -hmm. Each of these responses I just read were different. There are many others in the chat that were even more different. And, and, and they're all potentially correct, right? There's an infinite a range of how therapy can be done. And so we're, deliver practice is the idea of giving you the opportunity to discover how therapy will work best for you as a therapist and your client, uh, and then, you know, get some rehearsals in. Should we try a different um, client statement? Yeah, let's do it. All right. So let's try a different client statement. So the client says, I've smoked since I was 15 years old. I've never been able to quit. Right. Let's give people a moment to try a complex reflection for that one. And we already have we, we have one. I'll I'll read here. Robert, here's the first response. Yeah. You've wanted to quit, but it's been hard. Yeah. <clears throat> and, you know, Julia, if I might offer you a little feedback on that one, and I think it really hits at a couple things. And um, you're sort of you're sort of addressing you're, you've gone beyond even the exercise. You've actually created somewhat of a double sided reflection to some extent, but sort of emphasizing that, you know, that the hard part first as part of that reflection and <clears throat> and then emphasizing their efforts and the second part. Of the reflection because what we know is that sort of where we end our reflections is where the conversation oftentimes go and <clears throat> so we can it's kind of fun to play around with the the direction and, and what we put first and what we put second and and so Robert, Robert, what you're saying there is that that response actually went a bit beyond these skill criteria and can you just explain to people why would it be valuable for 
uh, people learning MI to learn to be able to stick to just this skill rather than go beyond it? Like what situations mm -hmm. would that be valuable for? Mm -hmm. You know, I think, <clears throat> I think as we're, especially as we're kind of getting to know clients and in those initial interactions, you know, we're wanting, I'm, I'm wanting to be really careful to not jump too much ahead mm -hmm. and to really just kind of, you know, keep, kind of keep the conversation going, you know, really keep the client talking and, um, you know, and, and at some point, you know, when, as, as the conversation is deepening, we can move into those more complex reflections, but, <clears throat> you know, just really kind of getting, making sure we get it before we kind of start to go deeper into it. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to read another response here. Uh, you're upset about your efforts not bearing fruit. Hmm. So, so really kind of trying to dive into some of the emotion in, in that and, <clears throat> and taking a guess, you know, so they didn't necessarily say they were upset, but they're sort of in a, like in the, in, in the prompt there, there's the, the frustrated, um, you know, sometimes we, you know, it's that, it's that balance between, you know, we, we don't want to sort of sometimes give an overreaction too strong of an overreaction emotionally, mm. um, because sometimes they'll overcorrect back and they'll say, well, you know, I'm not that upset. Um, <clears throat> so kind of, you know, being okay to state, you know, like the emotion, but my tendency, and I, and I think what we, we teach oftentimes is like, don't try to overstate it too much, the emotion right off the bat. They will correct us, and and if they're correcting us in a stronger emotional direction, fantastic, um, because that's sort of that's that's letting that's giving them the freedom to do that. Versus if we're overstating it, they oftentimes will correct us back the other direction. And so, just a little nuance. Um, mm. I think it's great. I think that I think the reflection really hit hit a lot of the criteria there here's another one and let's see if this is you know if this is uh the same thing you just talked about uh you've spent a lot of time and energy trying to change this behavior hmm yeah and, and i think there's sort of an acknowledgement there i like that one because there's an acknowledgement of effort hmm. and and we might even really go a little bit further and it's a reflection but it's also an affirmation like where there's sort of a notice of what they've done and their and their efforts and shining a light on that. Um, trying to think. Repeat that again, too, yeah. if you can. You, you've spent a lot of time and energy trying to change this behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and 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 so there's there's the acknowledgement, and there's kind of like the 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 time and energy really kind of captures i think the essence of it and 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 it's like this acknowledgement not that you've just tried but you have spent a lot of time and energy mm -hmm. and anyone who's ever tried to quit smoking or any kind of an addictive behavior like you know how hard it is and i and so i like it really it really gets at that to me that resonates with me if i'm a client yeah um, here, here's another one. Uh, this might go a little further. You've smoked a long time and there are times you've wanted to quit, but it's difficult. Mm. You've smoked a long time. Repeat the second part there. Yeah, sure. You've smoked a long time and there are times you've wanted to quit, but it's difficult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And there's a, so there's a lot in that. That there's sort of several statements in that reflection. And, and so if I'm the client, like it's trying to figure out what, like they, they may respond to any number of those things. And so try to maybe like initially starting out, like pick a, just pick a part of that to reflect back. It, it's kind of like when people ask three or four questions at one time, we oftentimes are only going to get a response to one of the questions. And, and so pick the one, pick sort of the money reflection, pick the one you're really wanting them to hear from you and, and start there, you know, and, and then you always can kind of come back and follow up with a further reflection later on. Okay. 
Here, here's another one. I'm curious about this one. Your behavior of smoking is not aligning with your values. Your behavior of smoking is not aligning with your values. So <clears throat> kind of, re, you know, there's a reading, there's a reading in there that there's some, um, there's some discrepancy. And I, and I see what Melissa's maybe trying to do there is, you know, a little, even a little more advanced potentially where she's trying to develop some discrepancy, which is, you know, again, kind of down the road as we develop skills and MI, we're, we're, we are trying to develop that discrepancy between what's up, what's important to people, their value system and, and their, and their behavior, <laughs> you know, how would that client, you know, react to that? Not exactly sure. They, they may, th that may be too big of a jump for them at this, at this juncture. Um, but they may also kind of be like, yeah, you're right. <laughs> so, so it's that, it's always that question of how much do we read in, you know, how, I, I think there's sometimes, I always tell, you know, clinicians in training or even in advance, you know, sometimes there's some, there's some real value to taking some calculated risk in doing these reflections. You know, right. what the worst, the worst thing that happens is the client corrects us. Right. And, and then we learn even more information when they come back and correct us. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. So it, I mean, it, I, I would say even better than taking a risk with a client is first taking the risk and deliver practice mm -hmm. a bunch of times, right? Because what we're seeing here is the feedback you're giving is really rich. Uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of nuance to this, right? Mm -hmm. But what you're also saying is like, you know, these are all just like things to think about, but like all of these things you could try with a client. None of these are going to bomb or explode in someone's face, right? No, no. And I mean, clearly our group here, like, they have some experience in this and yeah. you know they're starting those reflections with you yeah. and your they're really yeah. keeping the focus on yeah on the on the client's statement and not yeah. kind of giving their own opinion or yeah. giving advice and yeah so there's a so, there's a lot of strength in the in the in the reflections we're seeing up on that screen right so we're so we're starting at a very high level yeah and and this is something else i want to highlight which is uh, that even though this is a pretty basic MI skill, and even though we're working with high level MI practitioners, you're still able to offer some pretty rich nuanced feedback, mm -hmm. which really goes to show that, you know, this is MI isn't something like, oh, you know, I studied it for a year, I did 100 clients, I'm competent, done. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's it's really like an ongoing process of continual refinement, which, I mean, probably goes throughout your career, you know, I, I mean, would you disagree or what? what? I mean, one of the things I love doing is sort of like when, uh, you know, oftentimes when, when we're introducing an exercise or activity to a group and a training is, um, you know, putting myself in that situation of having my, the group evaluate and give me feedback. Yeah. And I'm always just blown away by yeah things I missed and, yeah. and some of the amazing suggestions of, of people that maybe it was their first even exposure to MI. Yeah. And, and I, and I'm just always grateful for the feedback that, wow, I, I never thought of it that way. Yeah. I just want to add one thing as well. We're finding a lot of rich feedback just by focusing on the verbal written responses from our attendees here. And in normal dealer practice, we would be doing this in a role play fashion where we could also focus on the nuances of the non-verbals, how yeah. the intervention is being delivered, right? So maybe we could, quote unquote, have the content right, but the delivery of it could be off in some way. Like the emphasis you were saying before, Robert, of where do you emphasize in your intervention here, right? Yeah. So we're doing kind of a, a semi dealer practice here. And I would say like even, even more complex would be just doing this in a role play fashion. And I would imagine you have a lot of great feedback also on the nonverbals there. Absolutely. And, and you kind of mentioned there too, sort of the tonality of the statements and, you know, just being conscious of how are you ending statements? Are you ending statements as statements or are you ending statements as questions? <laughs> and, 
and that's one of the things I think we we really focus on when we're teaching those those complex reflections that, that early on, um, oftentimes, you know, those learning will want to turn it into a question because they're more, you know, maybe not worried, like, you know, not, not as confident in, in the reflection. And so, yeah, just, it's something we're, we're, we become more aware of. Yeah. How to try another one or a client statement. Mm-hmm. So a client says with some hostility, I like to drink. It's not a big deal. Let's give people a moment. Okay, Robert, here's the first few that are coming in. Your drinking doesn't bother you. Yeah, kind of a, you know, just a really basic, <clears throat> reflection um you know there's definitely something added there in terms of the bothering part and you know so you you, you know particularly with this this client statement you know particularly if this is like an early statement you know you're really not sure kind of where they fall with this so that's where these initial reflections back they you don't want to go too far because then you might you might get more pushback, and because in this statement we 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 obviously this goes beyond the scope, but we're hearing sustained talk in this statement very likely, and so the important we kind of stay just stay where they are, you know, just stay where they are. I always kind of talk about you know when you're hearing that, you know, you're hearing that sustained talk, you know, just um, slow down, um, don't go too fast, don't try to do too much. Um, you know, just like when you're driving in a, in a really strong thunderstorm <laughs> and, and let it emerge um, over time. Yeah. Great. Here's another one. You're comfortable with your drinking habit. So there's, uh, you know, again, kind of a, um, taking a next step. <clears throat> you know, you're adding in the word comfortable, which is not mm. what they said. Mm. And, and, and so it'd be really interesting to see what they would they would give you back they may say you're right i i i really don't you know i don't know why these other people in my life have such a hard time which awesome now you have more information so it's it, it's nice and succinct you know i go back to that it's really succinct you're saying less than they are let them talk more here's a little different you don't see problems with your drinking yeah. So you're, again, maybe overstating a little bit. You're using, uh, I don't have the statement up in front of me again, Tony. The The statement was... Alex, can you bring it up, please? Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. So, yeah. So there's not, they, they're adding in the word problems. And so they didn't state problems, but the reflection adds in problems. And so that may elicit something more back. But you're also not a disagreeing or trying to convince them that they have problems. It's just a reflection. You don't see you have any problems. Your drinking isn't a problem. <clears throat> yeah. Now, here, here's a different one. Uh, and I'm I'm curious if if this is just a simple reflection or if this is a different. Your drinking is not a big deal for you. Your drinking is not a big deal for you. Yeah, that seems <clears throat> I think that's I think that goes beyond the okay. The, the, that uh, again, I, I keep going back to the statements here, um, but it's you know it is more of a restating. Uh, it it does put you know it, it starts it off by you know putting it in the U. You know I like that. Um, you know it may not elicit as much back, but I I don't think you can go wrong with that. But it probably might fall a little more in the simple. Um, then <clears throat> kind of taking a little bit more of a guess, mm. you know, into, you know, when we think about complex emo- or reflections, we're thinking about, you know, some of those hunches we have, you know, trying to kind of read into um, emotion, you know, like what's going on for the client emotionally that mm. they're saying or not saying that we want to sort of try to capture. So here's one that goes to that point. Uh, you feel negatively judged when people bring up your drinking habits. 
Mm. <clears throat> so kind of really make, kind of going to a hunch and um, they haven't said that. And <clears throat> so it would be interesting. So you're kind of taking a guess like that the reason they're there, like, you know, you, you don't see that there's a problem yet. There's these other people out there that are negatively judging you. Yeah. I'm mean, now interesting. It sounds like complex reflections kind of work on a spectrum mm -hmm. where there are complex reflections that are closer to what the client just said. And usually you call those a bit safer, Robert, right? And there are those that on the more extreme end, which are still complex reflections, but are much more speculative at mm -hmm. the edge of mm -hmm. almost kind of being a bit too interpretive, right? So more dangerous. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, there, there's a, and there's a fine line here. Cause you know, which, which, you know, when we, cause some of these are even kind of moving into almost like an ample, what we would call an amplified reflection mm. where you're sort of over agreeing with the client or you're stating something in an extreme version to get a, to kind of get a, a response back from them. And again, I, I, I see a lot of, uh, a lot of folks in this room that have had quite a bit of training and um, have a lot of expertise that they're bringing into these responses. You know, now would you, would you say, I, I think the message I'm getting from you today, Robert, is uh, it is okay for the MI therapist to kind of push a little one way or the other. By push, I mean like go a little further or something, mm -hmm. you know, not yeah. push the client, but like go like a little, little bit further as long as they're doing it consciously, as long as they're thinking, okay, here I'm taking a bit of a reach and the client might disagree, in which case I'm going to mm -hmm. know how to react. Is that right? Correct. Right. And it's just trying to kind of, again, go like, you're not wanting to go too far mm -hmm. down the road, you know, particularly with a client, like when you're hearing this sustained talk, you know, you're really trying to kind of understand the different edges of where the client is with this issue and sometimes if you go too quick or too far you miss things mm. and you know i just always remember sitting and watching you know the founder of mi bill miller uh do this in a training and and you know dr miller just had this way of just like it just was so like he he just was a man of just less is more super slow and inevitably, you know, then the client just starts talking and things just emerge. But there's a patience there that I think, you know, I catch myself having to having to work on that. But like really the client, like really giving agency to the client to do the work in the room rather than kind of feeling like, OK, we've got to come up with this really nifty, complex reflection. Um the, the client has a lot of information that if we can kind of get out of the way, oftentimes they're going to come forward with that information. Would you call that part of the spirit of MI? Mm, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, that, that, that collaborative part, that, you know, non-hierarchical way of interacting, uh, not knowing, the being curious, um, you know, really giving the client a lot of autonomy to go where they want to go. I mean, that's, yeah, that's that, that's the spirit part of it. And so it, it, in terms of deliberate practice, how do you think deliberate practice can help trainees or experienced clinicians kind of learn the spirit of MI or stay in the spirit of MI? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, I think what, when, when, clinicians allow themselves to kind of go into this learning process. Um, first of all, I think it, it sort of gives them instant feedback on kind of where they are and their growth. And, and so I think it, it and, and I think what they're going to notice is it really, um, they see their clients start responding differently. Again, I, I go into my own training and um, I actually see my coach popped into the, the, the training here today. And, um, and I just remember like just those aha moments when I started to practice more deliberately, um, how differently my clients started responding and how I started to see, A, they were really working differently. They were starting to talk more about change as I 
just made some small subtle changes mm. to the way in which I worked with them and related mm. to them. So it, I, I think it really, it, 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 again, if you pay attention, and I think as you do that, the confidence grows because you start to get the feedback mm. from your clients because they're starting to they're starting to do something different and show up differently in the room. Great. One thing I would like to just add to this conversation, what we have found, especially when you develop a supervisory relationship over time, where you're seeing the same trainee or supervisee over time and doing the little practice with them, you start to find on patterns of their own growth edges, things that they need to work on over time, right? So, for example, in the spectrum of complex reflections that we just saw today, some people might tend towards, let's call it safer uh, cool. complex reflections more towards the edgy a bit more speculative ones and this is really where the little practice in supervision can help in individual supervision cool. and we have found again and again is that as you're working as a supervisor using the little practice not just talking about theory but actually doing these kind of skill building exercises you'll get a feel for where your trainee is at what they can do comfortably and what they need sustained work over time right and Robert, it seems like you've had a lot of experience kind of working on yourself and other people like over time. Would oh, you right. say that like the little practice is a good way to assess over time the growth edges of surprises? Yeah, I think it it really does. And it and what's I think what I think is great for a supervisor and trainee is it 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 really does give you some indicators of growth. And you know, and, and there there are ways that we can assess that, you know you know, just by, you know, just when clients start listening to their sessions and, and they really start seeing the changes and how they're communicating in session. So they're, they're, you have some really nice markers. And I, and I think with MI, you know, the, I think MI has, has really created some systems and ways of being able to more objectively evaluate, like how you're doing you know, by really, you know, by, you know, coding sessions and, and give, how to give feedback. And so it, it's a really great opportunity for growth if you take it that way <clears throat> and take it slow. You know, I think we've, we've lost sometimes the, 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 some of those, those really core skills in our training, you know, we want to get to the home run skill. Mm -hmm. And when, when yet oftentimes it's really, it's, it's the, it's being patient. It's the singles, so to speak, using a baseball metaphor um, that oftentimes is what really helps the client move forward. We, we've got some questions here. We're running out of time, so we'll see how much time we have for questions. Thank you, everyone, for your questions and uh, participating today. Mm -hmm. uh, Juliet asks, today's skill is very different from the attunement skill where we're encouraged to make statements in the form of questions. Mm -hmm. When do you do which? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think, you know, we, we definitely were obviously over, over focusing on, on reflections today and yet, um, and it's not that we're saying there's not a place for questions. Um, it, it's, <clears throat> you know, so the, the reflections of course, I think are really consistent with the attunement with the, those attunement skills. Um, and, and yet, you know, sometimes as we're kind of moving along through the conversation and we're reflecting and we're getting information, um, and I'll, you know, maybe go a little bit further here than we, we meant to go today, but, but it's like, sometimes there's a piece of information that we're not, that's not popping out. That's kind of critical to where we go with it. So we're, we then want to ask, you know, maybe an appropriate open-ended question to try to get that data. You know, if I'm trying to kind of understand more about, you know, like, like if reasons for what, like why someone isn't wanting to change or wanting to change isn't becoming clear to me, um, you know, trying to figure that may be an appropriate place for a question. Um, I don't, I don't know if that helps, but we're, yeah. but we're really trying to, what I, what I kind of discovered through my own growth was that as I began to play with and learn how to put my questions into reflections is um, I, I really begin to see the the same information come out and, and the cadence of the session became more fluid than when I was over relying on questions. 
And <clears throat> it was something I, I, I discovered. I think that was one of my big discoveries in my own growth is that because my initial training was in solution focused therapy, which is a bunch of questions. Yeah. And again, not to say that there's not a place for it. it and, and going to other models, someone else asked, Melissa asked, can we use some MI skills in DBT therapy? Does it transcend to different modalities as well? Yeah, common question I get. And the answer is absolutely yes. So the best metaphor I've ever, and I don't, I don't know where I heard it or whether it just popped into my head at one point, but I, I kind of think of MI as, you know, if you're, if you're a Windows person, um, it, it's sort of the operating system that kind of runs in the background of of how you think and you work and you show up and and then you know other models really fit well you know so you know some of the training i do is like you know sort of a combo mi cbt where the process by which we get there and deliver dbt cbt you know whatever other modality it really blends well but it's always running you know, and I, I think that was the biggest thing for me is it it changed how I how I thought about the overall interaction and how I was going to show up as a practitioner in the room. And and I, you know, I, I pull from all kinds of different theory and model because ultimately I'm going to use what is going to work for the client, not what I'm sort of wed to. But that MI is constantly there <clears throat> kind of running right so so doing these exercises learning this will be valuable for therapists working you know broad range of models and yeah. populations yeah. um we 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 should wrap up because we're 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 out of time i want to uh say thank you very much robert for joining us this is this has been a very rich hour and uh i i think we got a lot out of this thank you a lot to our participants uh for your comments for your for trying the exercises in the chat we had some really good responses some really uh so we it really led to a very rich discussion of this and um we're going to record this so we recorded it so you'll be able to see it again and please check out our uh, website for future uh events and hopefully we can do more webinars with you robert that'd be really uh really great and um and i think I think that's it. So thank you, everyone.